this is Jerry Warburg, professor at the Batten School at University of Virginia, and I'm speaking to you from my office in Garrett Hall. Uh, it's great to be joined in this virtual classroom by a number of students and practitioners and friends and family uh, and a number of alums from around the country. Um, I'm eager to get my vaccine so we can do this in person. Uh, we've all learned a lot about Zoom, but we've also learned uh, to hate Zoom at times and getting Zoom neck. Uh, unfortunately, Virginia, I learned, is 49th out of 50 states and getting vaccines into arms. So it'll be a few more weeks before we can have live classes. Um, I want to speak to you today about Congress and national security policy, and I want to share with you specifically why I am optimistic Congress can improve its performance as a co-equal branch of government, and why I believe stepping up to this task is an essential part of broader reforms Americans must make to secure our very fragile democracy. Now, Harry Truman liked to say that optimists make opportunities out of difficulties. Well, we Americans have plenty of difficulties right now, and you guys know the list. More than 400,000 United States deaths from a raging global pandemic, an armed insurrection that assaulted the United States Capitol to support an attempted coup by a mob incited and lied to by the President of the United States, combating systemic racism, inequalities which we've seen exacerbated by a deep recession. It's actually a depression if you're in the entertainment, hospitality, performing arts, or travel industry, and a climate crisis impacting many cities and states now, not in some theoretical future. Finally, a crisis of confidence in our government, something I want to speak about directly, and the very institutions we need to be strong. Now, amidst multiple crises, uh, there are, of course, numerous opportunities for crucial reforms. Indeed, throughout American history, it's been in crisis when most of our major social reforms and progress have been made. And here I have to quote Helen Keller. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be accomplished without hope and confidence. We need that kind of hope and confidence now that the citizens of our battered land see the guardrails of democracy have held, but just barely. Prior to January 20th, an out of control executive and his enablers undercut key domestic and international institutions. Our allies were terrified. Our adversaries were laughing. President Biden and Vice President Harris have indicated that reconciliation and renewal will first require a sober damage assessment. Domestic reforms essential to protect our democracy will be advanced in what we've already seen as a narrowly divided Congress. These reforms will likely focus on voting rights, election security, public health, immigration, and criminal justice reform, just to name a few. But it's notable that in a 50-50 Senate, and a very narrowly divided House, it's the centrists who will have the power to shape a bipartisan consensus. And they will have the deciding votes. Legislators like Joe Manchin, Mark Warner, Lisa Murkowski, and Pat Toomey in the Senate, members of the Sweet 16, so-called group of 16 centrists that President Biden has already met with um, in his first week in office. The executive branch, I also point out, is led by two senators, one of whom I had the privilege of working with for years, Joe Biden on the Foreign Relations Committee. But both Biden and Harris long fought to defend congressional prerogatives. I know where they stand is where they sit. Maybe their views have changed a little bit, um, but we'll see very soon. In the realm of foreign policy and national security, there's some very clear lessons to be learned from some of these past battles between the legislature and the executive. And we need to look at a previous crisis, the post-Watergate reforms after the 1974 resignation of President Richard Nixon, when a restoration of constitutional balance was systematically advanced by legislators. Reformers in 1974 took their cue from the nation's founders, whose factions were united by skepticism of imperial executives like King George. The Constitution methodically placed powers to oversee the military, foreign and trade policy, tariffs, and appointment of ambassadors, in the legislative branch. Congress was and is the first branch of our government. The United States was 13 years old before we even had a chief executive. But beginning really with Franklin Roosevelt um, and the run-up to World War II, so-called imperial presidency has grown. The criminality of Watergate, which extended far beyond the break-in, and the Vietnam disaster produced in the 1970s a series of really valuable reforms I want to talk a little bit about today, both domestic and foreign. What were these reforms? 
They included, listen carefully, a curb on presidential misuse of appropriated funds, limits on White House declarations of fake emergencies, checks on transactional alliances with dictators who ignored basic human rights, limits on promiscuous arms sales. If you listen carefully, you'll note almost the exact same list of abuses marked the valueless foreign policies of President Biden's predecessor, the elephant who was just voted out of the room, if you will. The problem is that in the post-Cold War era, Congress has ducked accountability on matters of war and peace time and again. Why? I spent 40 years in politics, including parts of three decades working on the House and Senate floor with party leaders, but I could not give an easy answer to why. Why would anybody in Washington give up power? It just doesn't happen. Why would politicians in our first, first branch of government forfeit crucial powers spelled out in the Constitution? And what reforms might now restore the balanced design that our founders created? Well, let me tell you, the cool thing about being a UVA professor, uh, my brother Jason's on the line. He knows this from being a legislative assistant in the US Congress as well. Um, you can call up almost anybody in the country and get them to answer your questions when you're doing research. So I won a grant from UVA Center for Effective Lawmaking here at the Batten School. And I got the chance over the course of 12 months to interview um, a couple dozen senior legislators. Some of them retired, speaking very candidly on background. Some of them on the record, elected officials running for office. People like Tim Kaine, Senator Jeff Blake, Republican of Arizona, Jerry Conley, Democrat of Virginia, Ileana ross uh Republican, a chairwoman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, even the key appropriations clerks who write those massive, obscene 4,000-page bills at the end of the session. I talked to them, and they shared some great insights, some lessons learned with searing candor. Now, very briefly, let me summarize what the conclusions were of this Batten School study before turning to your questions. The post-Watergate reforms, so-called, from the 1970s, established a set of procedural gauntlets to ensure that a runaway executive would not diminish foreign relations to the very sort of transactional abuses we've recently seen, winking at Saudi murders of residents of Fairfax, Virginia, who write for the Washington Post, selling totally inappropriate weapons to Persian Gulf sheikdoms as a payoff for consenting to recognize Israel asking U.S. diplomats, foreign service officers, to lobby the British to move a golf tourney to a POTUS-owned course. Enough. To quote one of my heroes, Mark McGuire, tainted baseball player, we're not here to talk about the past. I trust my audience will recognize the seditious author of those abuses. He's been evicted. He's been shamed, and he's facing a record second impeachment trial in the United States Senate this week. But now we need to clean up the mess he left. And the basic problem is this. Leaders in Congress of both parties, liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, have for years dodged their constitutional duties, ducking tough votes and accountability on major national security issues. Here's how Senator Jeff Flake describes it. Congress has forfeited its powers. We've given up these powers because of our dysfunction, close quote. Well, my point today, my key point is this dysfunction harms our national security. It weakens our alliances and it undermines the sustainability of US commitments. So Congress has got to step up. Congress has got to accept the responsibilities placed upon it by the constitution. And I believe this will be a central work to repair the guardrails of democracy. So recently tested. In the national security policy space, the action items I believe must be enacted include Five, one, require passage of annual authorization and appropriations measures on time as freestanding bills, something done just four of the last 40 years. And let me be clear here, failure should result in a forfeiture of members' pay for each day of delinquency, not to be retroactively refunded. Um, we don't pay contractors who don't finish their work. We shouldn't pay politicians who cannot adopt a budget. Point two, Reform war powers by reasserting legislative responsibility over declaring war and reasserting this through policy writers on the annual defense spending bills. Why do I say this? Is this inside baseball? No, we just learned that the defense bill is essentially veto-proof. It was the only override 
of Biden's predecessor in his four years in office. Um, so you attach the war powers reform language to the defense bill. And if it's vetoed, it will be overridden. Number three, limit presidential waivers and tighten requirements to halt presidential abuses of so-called emergencies, like the emergency arms sale to Saudi Arabia, stuff that they're not going to get for five years, or the sudden emergency on our southern border that was declared in order to reprogram billions of military construction funds. Number four, sunset the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. This is ridiculous. We're prosecuting a war against groups that didn't even exist, like ISIS when the 2001 AUMF was written. And this has led to the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, still prosecuted absent any declaration of war or a clear exit plan. And number five, reassert subpoena powers to produce timely testimony. Like say, for example, if we're having an impeachment trial and a witness like John Bolton says, I really, really wanna tell you stuff, but it's in my new book, you'll have to read my book. Um, for goodness sakes, we're gonna have a trial. We need to be able to compel witness testimony. This should not be a negotiable matter with the defendant. Uh, subpoena powers are essential for policy oversight. And I would add to that a requirement for national security advisor. The key national security advisor is the President of the United States should be subject to confirmation and accountable to the United States Senate. Well, I'm eager to get to the audience questions and to your comments. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap up with this key point. We need to do these things to make our allies more reliable and to deter our adversaries. We'll be a more secure nation by engaging legislators more effectively in building the case for foreign commitments, just as we did with the Marshall Plan or the Human Space Program. Use Congress to educate the public. That's how you secure the public support essential to sustainable alliances, both at home and abroad. I believe that these can be key steps to make the American people safer in troubled times, to restore some of the guardrails to our very fragile democracy. With that, let me open up the floor. I'm delighted to see so many uh, students, former students, alums with us. And I'm going to turn to my colleague and friend, Aaron Tor, who will be curating the questions for me. Thank you, Aaron. Sure. Thanks so much, Jerry. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, I mentioned in the chat that we'll be taking questions via Q&A. So you should see that button on the bottom of your screen. Feel free to submit throughout. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can before 2.30 today. Um, to kick us off, Jerry, I have a couple pre-submitted questions for you. Uh, number one, a bit of a bigger picture here on foreign versus domestic policy reforms. Uh, do you think it likely that such national security policy reforms will have to wait on pandemic crisis and impeachment and budget relief and tax reform? Uh, part one of the question, part two, maybe some of these would strengthen Congress and, and centrist hands in coming fights. Uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the first part first. Um, yeah, uh, they've got to deal with COVID relief. They've got to deal with the impeachment trial. They've got to get uh, a budget moving uh, for fiscal year uh, 22. Uh, and they've got to do those things first. Um, and the president uh, is committed to that. Um, but these reforms cannot wait a long time. I don't want to see these kicked down the road to 22, 23. Um, and then there'll be arguments, of course, with the pending election that we should defer them. Uh, these are clear areas where Republicans and Democrats have seen Congress get weaker, weaker, weaker at the expense of more imperial, more removed, more government by executive order president. And whether you prefer this incumbent to his predecessor or not, um, the power balance is way out of whack. So we're going to have to get to these national security reforms. But I can see that the pandemic response, the impeachment trial, and the budget uh, will have to come first. Indeed, even organizing the Senate and agreeing on uh, who, what the committee ratios are uh, has been delayed this week as Mr. McConnell tried to use his last remaining bit of leverage. Um, on the second part of your question, Aaron, uh, I think it's really fascinating that actually the centrist, the so-called sweet 16, uh, the press's term, not mine, um, they're already wielding the power. Everybody was holding their breath yesterday just on a procedural motion to see how many Republicans uh, broke with a party line vote. Uh, and McConnell, who's for conviction, uh, voted to table. So that was, really was, a, was a, an unclear vote. Uh, I don't take it as a foregone conclusion they won't convict. Um, but the centrists are more powerful. Manchin on climate, Collins on impeachment, 
Uh, Portman, now that he's a free agent, has announced he's not running for re-election. Toomey, he's clearly a free agent uh, and voted um, against uh, the motion to table yesterday. So I think you're going to see these centrists find their vocal cords and, and find their spine, which has unfortunately been um, missing in a number of previous instances, both parties, both houses of Congress. Remains to be seen. We can be optimistic. Uh, second question I have here for you, Jerry, um, is a little bit more about the process of your research. What surprised you most from hearing members vent? I was struck, and I've been doing this for 43 years, I shouldn't be surprised, but I was still surprised, Aaron, by how visceral their reaction of anger and shame was at how Congress had acted. I'll give you one example. Ileana ross Leitman uh, kept going off the record to say really colorful stuff, but she told me on the record um, what happened when they tried to do a State Department authorization bill in her committee. And if you don't do an annual bill, you don't have a vehicle to move your legislative freight. So this is very important to her role as House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairwoman. Uh, and she said it was like herding cats, that there were all these amendments that were clearly being offered not to make policy, but to generate a fundraising letter. You know, Erin Tor, she, she hates puppies. You know, she voted against my resolution saying we love puppies. We, we saw how Mr. Northam used a puppy ad in his Senate campaign race. Well, this occurred often when I worked in the Senate till my Senator one day said, I'm not gonna vote for these 99 to nothing resolutions anymore. They're nonsense, I'm gonna vote against them. Yep. Uh, and I said, are you planning to retire? Because there'll be direct mail ads from against you that you're supportive of the bad guys because you voted against this nonsense, um, but he did. So it's the visceral reaction in private, 90 senators will tell you how much they dislike Joe Biden's predecessor. But when the roll call comes, a bunch of them chicken out. And I was surprised how visceral the criticism of Democrats and Republicans was of the Congress itself for a failure to be accountable on war and peace stuff. They know it. They're ashamed of it. They want somebody to make them stop doing it. Yep. Again, remains to be seen. Uh, moving on to a couple of our audience questions. We have one from Aaron White. What role has the limited party system played in increasing presidential power as well decreasing congressional responsibilities? And how could this be guided toward balanced politics? The limited party, uh, I believe you referred to is the fact we only have two. There's not a third party um, opportunity there. Uh, and what happens is kind of what you saw yesterday on a procedural vote. The leadership tells you if you vote against me on a procedural vote, you're not a member of the party because you've taken away our party's authority to set the agenda. And you may no longer have a committee assignment and you may no longer have campaign support from the party. So the two party system has um, been an inhibition uh, to getting some things done. All the Republicans felt free to vote against the US-Iran nuclear accord, even though Israeli intelligence leaders, US intelligence leaders, the US military, and all our allies in Europe and our adversaries in Russia and China all were for it. They just thought it was a free vote. We can all be against it. And then if anything goes wrong, we can blame the president. That's the problem with the two party system. If you line up on a party line to vote against, vote on something that, that affects national security, you may think you have a free vote, but in fact, you're undermining alliances, you're uh, indicating weakness to your adversaries, um, and you're really limiting our nation's ability to defend our national security interests. Uh, I have a two-part question here from Emily Perkins. Some are optimistic that Democrats will be able to pass a lot of legislation since there's a Democratic executive branch, Democratic House, and a split Senate that will likely go Democratic in a 50-50 tie. But I'm not so optimistic given the power of individual senators to obstruct the legislative process with threatening to filibuster. What's your outlook on this next Congress? Part one, part two, do you think that Democrats will be able to pass lasting legislation? I'm optimistic and yes. <laughs> um, I had to not just go to the Truman well, but go to the Helen Keller well uh, to give you some optimistic inspiration in my quotes today. Um, but you got no business being in politics unless you're an optimist, that you believe that the people acting together in concert uh, with duly elected officials doing their duties can move this country forward. We've done it time and time again. 
Uh, some of the most far-reaching legislation in American history was passed not after the Civil War, but during the Civil War. The Morrill Act, creating land-grant colleges, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, and of course the 14th Amendment, which may come back into play in a few weeks here if we need to bar Biden's predecessor uh, from running for office again. So I'm very optimistic that there will be a robust agenda. Why? Because I think Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi will step down if they're not able to move a robust agenda. They have spoken over and over again in public. I look again at um, uh, Schumer's long interview with Maddow, going back to his roots as a Vietnam War protester, said, I'm here to do big, bold actions. And if we're held back, uh, my words, not his, we'll change the rules. Um, they already have filibuster proof uh, 51 votes for a number of different uh, motions to proceed um, on executive nominations. Um, I think you'll see that on voting rights and election security as a fundamental national security issue, and they'll eliminate the filibuster for that. And if that doesn't get the Republicans' attention, I think they will proceed to eliminate the filibuster altogether. I don't think that will happen in the first two years of the Biden Harris administration. I think it may well happen in the third year in 2023. And of course, you've now got seats in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, Republican held seats that will be in play in 2022 if the Republican Party continues to block. And let's be fair here the Democratic Party blocked and blocked and blocked and ducked votes under Biden's predecessor. The Republican Party did it for six years from 2010 to 2016, and announced that that was their goal, to make Obama a one-term president and to pass judges by the legislation we do not pass, uh, House Speaker John Boehner famously said, i.e., let's gum up the works and do nothing, and that way we'll end up with less government. Well, folks, I'm a bit of a libertarian myself, and I don't think the government has a solution to every problem, but they didn't produce less government. They just produced gridlock and a whole lot of executive orders and, and bills that provide $3 trillion in funding that no one's read that are passed uh, on Christmas Eve. Um, so it didn't really lead to better government. It didn't lead to smaller government. And I think Schumer, Durbin, Pelosi, and even at this point, yes, Mitch McConnell, um, believe that if the Senate continues to protect members over and over and over again from making tough votes, when they've got a six-year term, for goodness sake, um, to explain their votes, um, the Senate is going to be pushed farther and farther to the margins of American society when, in fact, the House and Senate were intended to be the first branch of government. We've got another question here related to filibuster, Jerry. Do you think congressional mechanisms like the filibuster can be used to better efficiency in Congress by fostering ideas and debate to offer less partisanship and more compromise? Yes, and I think they have over the years. Uh, that's what the filibuster was used for until uh, the 2000s. Um, the filibuster was used to force the other side to take some of your amendments. Uh, but when that finally started to fall apart was with the Affordable Care Act. Remember, the Democrats had 60 senators and a, a big majority in the House. Um, then Senator Kennedy died and Scott Brown unexpectedly won. So they only had 59 senators. Well, they spent months and months and months in committee hearings and committee markups going through the bill line by line by line. And after all, it was a Republican proposal. It was Massachusetts market-based Romney care, did not have the public option. Uh, it was a Republican tailored bill. So the Democrats took scores, hundreds of amendments, and then the Republicans voted on block against the bill and filibustered it. Um, that's not fair. It's like Lucy pulling the football out from Charlie Brown, and he's about to kick it for you Peanuts fans. Um, and over time, the Democrats just said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to do things through the reconciliation process, an obscure term that my Congress 101 class knows very well. Um, once a year, you get a, a vote that's only 51 votes, and you'll see everything in the kitchen sink loaded into that bill this year. Biden's already talking publicly about using reconciliation for the COVID relief package. Because uh, Virginia is not going to get from 49th out of 50 states and putting shots in arms until we get that COVID relief package and we stand up more vaccination centers. A uh, question here from Baton Professor Jay Shimshak. What does it look like to use Congress to educate the public? Uh, Professor Shimshak, uh, thank you for your question, Jay. Um, it looks like the Marshall Plan. When Congress had no intention of giving a whole lot of money to Europe after we just bailed them out, comma, again, in World War II, and the GIs were coming home. Um, Vandenberg famously told Truman 
uh, after Atchison said, we, if you guys don't pass this, you know, Greece and Turkey are going to go communist. And Vandenberg said to Truman, you get Atchison up in the hill and you have him say that and I'll get you the money. And that was the beginning of the Marshall Plan. Um, and two of the key guys for the Marshall Plan were freshman vets of World War II, uh, a guy named Jack Kennedy and a guy named Richard Nixon, who worked very closely together to build public support. And Nixon was a conservative Republican from Southern California. Um, they worked to build public support for the Marshall Plan as an anti-communist initiative. It worked. And that was the beginning of the NATO alliance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing happened with a manned spaceflight program, um, human spaceflight program, excuse me, ladies. Uh, but it started out as the manned spaceflight program in the 50s. There wasn't a big public appetite for sending uh, men and women up into space. Um, it was a big jobs program for Texas and Florida, as it turned out. Uh, the vice president was from Texas. He was in charge of it. That's why the Johnson Space Command Center is in Houston. Um, but they used hearings over weeks and months to help the American people understand um, the value in this. It's frankly exactly what we're going to need to do to help more and more Americans understand um, that the last election in November was the freest and fairest and most secure election we've ever held, according to a whole bunch of Republican secretaries of state and Republican appointed federal court judges. We need to get to the people, the 60% of the Republican Party, um, who think Biden's predecessor won and Biden stole the election. We need over time for them to understand through facts that that is false. They were misled. Uh, and that's how you use Congress through the hearing process. Uh, we have a couple more questions, Jerry. We'll try and fit in as many as we can. Um, let's see, we have one. Uh, in your opinion, what is most at stake in Congress right now? Oh, the future of democracy, uh, nothing, nothing major. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of people in the country who are really fed up with a system that would put um, uh, a talk show host who really has no interest in policy and had very few legislative achievements. His idea of achievement was to sign something in a Sharpie pen, uh, an executive order. And let's be fair, that's what Joe Biden's been doing for a week now, executive orders. Um, but I think the stakes are very, very high. There's a whole generation here that could lose faith in the democratic process and elections and voting. Um, and I would say the glass is half full. Look at what a free and fair and secure election we had in the middle of the pandemic. And look at the brave men and women, the town clerks, the PTA dads and moms who sat side by side and counted the votes under death threats. These were not Republicans and Democrats. These were local citizens who know each other, who see each other in church, who see each other in Little League. They're not going to cheat each other. And by the way, all the local races were on the ballot also. Have you heard any local races or congressmen who were elected in the same election say, my, my election was subject to a lot of fraud, so I should stand down. I shouldn't be sitting in the House of Representatives. There are members from Pennsylvania who voted to decertify this very same Pennsylvania election results that brought them into office. Um, it's shameful, the hypocrisy of those positions. So the stakes are very high. Um, frankly, in my narrow niche issue here of Congress being accountable on war and peace issues, I think they're very high. Um, one of the things that I agreed with Biden's predecessor on was these forever wars that go on for 20 years because there are a few generals or a few blue coast elitist think tankers who think we ought to stay in Afghanistan for another 10 years. No, enough, we're done, goodbye, we're out. I agree with that. Um, and I think you have to have Congress take the responsibility they were given in the Constitution. It's why we fought the war with King George. It's why the Constitution was written the way it was. For Congress, closer to the people, to have the war and peace power, to have the trade agreement power, and to approve ambassadors and treaties that they negotiate. Otherwise, the stakes are low. Insignificant. Uh, Jerry, we only have another minute, but um, we have a couple questions I'd like to get to still. Can we go over about two or three minutes? Super. Great. So uh, how might the events of January 6th change Congress for the good? For the good, excuse me. I've been on a congressional delegation with Republicans and Democrats, and we hit some really bad air turbulence. And everybody looked at each other like that moment in Almost Famous where everyone confesses their sins when they think the plane's going down. We were Republicans and Democrats on that CODEL coming back from the Idaho nuclear labs. 
um, we were citizens and fellow human beings. And I think of that moment, that's what it's like in the well of the Senate where I sat for years and years as a staffer and old staff chair. They don't treat each other as Republicans and Democrats, they treat each other as citizens. It's just when the cameras come on and, and they're voting that they play partisan games. So um, I, I, I think that type of humanity uh, can help get us across the line on some of these major problems. Um, and I think that the events of January 6th, where they were hustled out within shouting distance of armed protesters chanting, kill Pence, hang Pence, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as Dr. Johnson said, the prospect of a hanging in the morning concentrates the mind. Um, yeah, I think these men and women, a number of whom were, were forced into a secure room together, a number of whom refused to mask as some asinine point of partisan pride, and then a bunch of those elderly members got sick in that room from their colleagues. I think there's a sobering effect that that has. And even now this week, you saw 100 senators sitting with masks on at their desks. And you've seen members of Congress who like to pack heat on the House floor getting stopped at the metal detectors and refused entry to the House floor. So I think there's a sobering effect. Um, and I think the fact that police officers, cops that my family knew by name for years, who guarded us and kept us safe, that they were attacked, assaulted, and killed by the vicious mob um, has got to have a sobering effect on true patriots. Last question, Jerry. Um, do you have tips for how to become a more informed and engaged citizen? Yes. Do not allow yourself to have your news feed curated by anybody. Take responsibility for your own news consumption. If you read the Washington Post every day, be sure and read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. You'll know what Rupert Murdoch uh, is thinking. If you watch Rachel Maddow every night, you gotta watch Fox News as well. You've gotta triangulate, you've gotta have multiple sources. I found it fascinating. I actually watched the post November 3rd election coverage pretty heavily on Fox and was watching it live when they called the race for President Biden. I think it's very important to know the narrative that other parts of the country are getting and consuming as if it's the tablet from Mount Sinai. Um, we need to know the narrative that's being put out there um, not just the narrative we're comfortable with, it's confirmation bias, but we need facts. Uh, and I find the BBC News World Service, the Wall Street Journal news pages, um, and some of the investigative reporting of the New York Times and your local newspaper. Yes, I read the Daily Progress and the Marin Independent Journal still to this day. But you can't be lazy, folks. You can't rely on a feed. They're going to serve up more of what you read yesterday, and it's going to be confirmation bias. It's lazy and it's not doing your duty as a citizen. So I think that's something that everyone uh, in this webinar and all of us should take away from this discussion. Uh, if you're just single sourcing uh, your news in order to be an informed citizen, you're not an informed citizen. You're just getting confirmation bias. So read up, get multiple sources uh, and prepare for the challenging weeks and months ahead. Aaron, let me just close. I know that's our last question. Um, I want to thank you and Millie Hicks and the folks at Batten for putting together these expert chats. Uh, I want to thank my students who I'll see uh, via Zoom next week. I want to thank the many alums, um, several of whom are working on Capitol Hill. Uh, and frankly, the most difficult time to go back to your question, uh, Aaron, I had on January 6th was in the town hall afterwards where we heard the personal testimony of students who I had encouraged to go into public service, who had encouraged to work in Congress, who had encouraged to work in leadership, uh, share their personal stories uh, of shoving furniture up against the door and barricading themselves in office and hearing people beat on the doors, urinate and defecate against their doors and try to get in to do them harm. Um, I felt anger, I felt shame, but I felt hope um, that there's still people like that in our country uh, who I liken to first responders, see the danger and they're running towards it. So bless you um, and thank you for all your labors and thanks to each of the team here. Thanks, Jerry. Take care. See you next time on Baton Expert Chats.